so this uh, will come back in the post lunch session and uh, this is this session is for stillbirth all of us know that stillbirth is something which we do not want but we can't prevent and india is one of those highest stillbirth rate so uh, and we have got major role to play so this uh, session we will be um, dealing with three cases uh, where uh, one is stillbirth, one is neonatal death. No. Achha, yeah. So, but then as we see that many, um, like many of the cases, we get to see the patient in subsequent pregnancy. And the patient will not go to in a neonatal death, patient will not go back to a pediatrician asking what will be the risk of recurrence or what will happen to my future pregnancy. She will come to you. So as an obstetrician, how do we deal with previous neonatal death? What investigation at least at our end we can do? And this investigation readily and easily available, like doable, at least uh, previously, uh, which uh, was not being available. So we, ha we uh, have included three cases and then subsequently I will be elaborating how to approach these uh, uh, stillbirth and the, uh, how do we understand these cases. So I welcome Dr. Ramya, our senior resident, to start this case presentation. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the post lunch session one. Uh, today our topic is stillbirths and neonatal death cases demystifying the mysteries. So uh, going about with case one, uh, Mrs. X, a 30 year old, she came to us in preconceptional period. She was para one with no live issues. She had a previous baby with congenital malformation, which had early, early neonatal death. And uh, she came to us with, and uh, on probing her, she had provided us with a video of the previous baby with congenital malformation. So going into the details, this is the uh, pedigree of the uh, patient. Uh, she had a third degree consanguineous marriages, uh, uh, consanguineous marriage, and no other uh, children were affected in her family. Uh, her first pregnancy, it was a, uh, a spontaneous conception, and it was booked and supervised at a local hospital with no medical uh, antenatal comorbidities. She had her routine ultrasound examination done at third, fifth, and eighth and uh, eighth month, and at term, and it was told to be normal. At term, she delivered by male segment cesarean section at a local hospital uh, for an unknown indication, and she delivered a baby was 3.4 kg, and the baby was detected with malformation and admitted in NICU in her local hospital, and the baby expired on day five. She came to us in preconceptional period, and on probing, this video was presented to us. I'm playing the video. You can see there is clitor in the belly. Uh, yeah, coming to a very quick part almost. Skin is covering the eyelids and external ear malformation. Uh, the umbilical cord is displaced uh, downwards and there is clitoral megaly with fused labia with left lip and palate. This is a picture showing the cleft lip and palate and crypt of thalamus. As I've already told, there is clitoral medalli, fused labia, and umbilical cord is displaced downwards. Then it's normal position. So how do we approach this case? Based on the, the uh, features we have observed, we came to a differential diagnosis. That is, could be a Fraser syndrome. So, uh, because of the previous baby has expired, we have tested the couple the clinical exome sequencing, and as we have expected, both of them have turned out to be carrier septicosis. This is the clinical exome sequencing of both the couple. This is a mother's uh, 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 clinical exome showing phrases. Uh, she is a carrier of phrases, and the same mutation has been found in the husband also. What is, uh, whenever we see a patient with renal age, a fetus renal agenesis, then we have to go about and see other uh, uh, features uh, which can uh, probe towards diagnosis of Reza's event. Those are crypt of thalamus, uh, middle of arterial malformation, cleft lip and palate, 
syndactyly um, uh, displacement of umbilicus and nipples along with urogenital malformations and ambiguous genitalia. Uh, Fraser syndrome is an autosomal recessive uh, disease, so there is risk of recurrence of 25% in subsequent pregnancies and there is need of prenatal invasive testing in each pregnancy. So we have advised the patient to plan pregnancy after one year with preconception for uh, folic acid. So, uh, and in next pregnancy, we have done a uh, uh, sampling of the week in subsequent pregnancy and that uh, baby was known to be a father. So we have continued the pregnancy, the baby, uh, she had delivered a baby. Whenever there is a uh, stillborn, we, uh, because of a malformation, uh, we have to see whether it is isolated malformation or any other associated malformation, any other systemic malformation, which can probe towards a genetic diagnosis. Differential diagnosis has to be made uh, according to the uh, malformations got, and uh, it has to be collected for genetic testing. When previous stillbirth is due to a malformation, it could be an isolated or part of genetic syndrome, as I have already told, and detailed history and investigations have uh, helped in performing possible diagnosis. The first step be, uh, being cardiac micro uh, RA, or and the second step being clinical exome sequencing. Coming to the uh, second case, uh, this is uh, Mrs. X. She is an elderly gravida, a 38 year old. She had previous history of two early neonatal deaths, and uh, she came to us at 32 weeks with polyhydramnios. It is recurrent polyhydramnios. This is the pedigree. She had uh, the patient has presented uh, with. Previous two early neonatal uh, deaths, both of them died with hypotonia at birth. On uh, examination of the mother, we have seen there is muscle weakness in the mother. So, uh, there is no paternal his, uh, history on the father's side. When we have taken history of the maternal side, mother has a brother with similar uh, muscle, muscle weakness, and mother, uh, the patient's mother, had history of pacemaker implantation. And the patient's uncle had history of cataract. So, coming to the obstetric history of the uh, uh, patient, first pregnancy was a book then supervised pregnancy with no medical comorbidity. She had polyhydramnios even in bad pregnancy and fifth month of gestation. And there was no history of perception of fetal moments in the whole pregnancy. At 34 weeks, she had history of uh, PPRR and LSES was done at a local hospital. She delivered a 2.2 kg baby and with hypotonia. That baby was admitted in NICU and expired after two days of um, uh, uh, two days of life. The second pregnancy also uh, more or less the same history. She had polyhydramnios from uh, fifth month of gestation and uh, no perception of fetal moments. And she had uh, PPRM at 32 weeks of the, uh, pregnancy and she had delivered a hypotonic baby that expired on day one of life. She had come to us in third pregnancy at 32 weeks of preg uh, pregnancy with recurrent polyhydramnios. Uh, see, polyhydramnios, we have ruled that first uh, 75 gram GTT had been done and it was normal. Then ultrasound examination suggested polyhydramnios. No other malformations were seen, but there were no fetal moments present during the examination. When we have examined the mother, she had a characteristic expressionless face and uh, on a detailed examination, uh, there was a uh, uh, difficulty in releasing the grip in scene, uh, as seen in this video. So we are uh, trying to shake mother's hand and we are, when we are releasing, it is very difficult for the mother to release the grip, as we can see. Uh, to act on our command, it is taking her time. The, these features are suggestive of myotonic dystrophy. Uh, in this pregnancy, she came to us during COVID time and it was advanced gestation. As I've already told, it was 32 weeks of gestation. So, prenatal testing was deferred by mother due to advanced gestation. She had delivered outside at a local hospital and the baby was hypotonic and baby expired on day one of life. 
So uh, whenever we see a fetal malformation, the condition is not just not be uh, uh, confined to the fetus. We have to detailly examine the mother and the family history is very important because many clues might be lying outside just the fetus. So this is the mother um, uh, with a characteristic expressionless face. This is our patient. This is a brother of patient with history of muscular weakness. And uh, as we can see, there is an expressionless face. This is the mother of the patient and she has history of pacemaker implantation. This is the uncle of the patient who has uh, muscular weakness and history of cataract. Features of myotonic dystrophy are uh, myotonia, muscular dystrophy, uh, cataract, ECG changes, uh, hypogonadism, and frontal balding. So, whenever you are approaching a case with polyhydramnios and recurrent stillbirth, as we all know, polyhydramnios is present in about 10% of all the pregnancies. Most common causes are maternal diabetes and malformations like cleft lip and palate, uh, fetal neck masses, uh, esophageal atresia without without fistula, duodenal atresia, and placent uh, placental tumors. And when these co uh, cases are handled, there are few rare uh, causes which present with decreased fetal movements. So in those cases, these detailed history uh, has to be elicited for, uh, and uh, detailed family history has to be taken, maternal examination to pick up the certain features and 75 gram uh, glucose tolerance test in cases of polyhydramnios and in ultrasound, all these features have to be looked for, for stomachs, lips, uh, spine and movements of all the limbs. In this case, as a uh, maternal dystrophy is an uh, autosomal dominant condition, there is a recurrence risk of 50%, uh, and other family members can be uh, affected. So, examination of all the family members is important, and prenatal invasive testing is required in subsequent pregnancies to pick it up earlier. Coming to the next case, uh, it is Mrs. X, 28 year old. She had previous history of one neonatal death and one infant death. Uh, well, uh, du during the second baby uh, 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 delivery, uh, uh, he was investigated and investigations were available, but no definite cause for death has been found. She was referred to us during the third pregnancy at 15 weeks. Uh, her obstetric diagnosis was gravidatory pattern 2 with normal issues at 15 weeks with history of early neonatal death and then infant death with query of neural development and delay. This is a pedigree, it is a consanguineous marriage and she had uh, two uh, uh, deaths uh, uh, previously, one neonatal and one infant death and she has uh, 15 weeks of current pregnancy. First pregnancy uh, was an uh, uh, uncomplicated pregnancy. She delivered by normal delivery a 2.5 kg baby that did not cry at birth and detected meconium aspiration. The baby expired on day 3 and the cause was probably uh, meconium aspiration syndrome uh, uh, as per her records. Second pregnancy, it was also a normal delivery and uh, it was average birth weight. The baby had initially... The baby was given uh, to the mother without any complications, but at six months, it was noticed to have developmental delay, and slowly at 12 months, the baby presented with seizures. This baby was investigated. Uh, the cardiotype of the child was normal. MRI uh, uh, suggested a white matter neurodegenerative disorder. The enzyme assay uh, re uh, revealed to be normal. The baby has expired at 22 months of age with inconclusive diagnosis. Uh, the, uh, it was uh, the diagnosis was neurodegenerative disorder under evaluation. When she had come to us at 15 uh, weeks, we have uh, gone about and done the clinical exam of the couple. This is the uh, uh, clinical exam report of the mother showing uh, Wolfram syndrome and the uh, mother is uh, seen to be a carrier. The same mutation was found in the father as well. 
So we form syndrome presents with uh, these clinical features. Uh, we, uh, progressive neurological uh, difficulties are seen in Wolfram syndrome, and these features over retrograde, uh, retrospectively, we have uh, correlated with the babies. And in, she came back to us in the third pregnancy. So we have got her chorionic villus sampling. Uh, this is a picture depending on chorionic villus sampling leading into the placenta and uh, chorionic villus taken onto the petri dish. And these are epingas bottles showing the uh, chorionic villus. Uh, and the, that report has, the baby has come out to be a carrier. So this baby is fine. She had again come to us during the fourth pregnancy. This is recently in December of 2022, that is this month. And that baby is again effective. So um, she opted for termination of the pregnancy. So uh, clinical exam sequencing is helpful when cause of previous stillbirth is not known. The test of effective child is the most important test. Uh, uh, if it is not possible, then we go ahead with the uh, couple, uh, testing of the couple. It is better to see these patients in the preconceptional period for testing uh, because it helps in earlier diagnosis in the next pregnancy and helps in counseling too. So these three cases were one with previous neonatal death with congenital malformation, one with previous neonatal death with polyhydramnios, recurrent polyhydramnios, and previous unexplained neonatal death. I invite now ma'am uh, to throw some light on biopsychic history and how to go about them. Thank you. Thank you, Ramya, for that. Uh... Uh, thank you, Ramya, for that, these three cases. And this is not uncommon in our day-to-day -day routine. We see congenital malformation, either uh, delivery or we see the, them uh, with history of previous congenital malformation. This uh, uh, recurrent polyhydramnios, we need to look for it and try to investigate as far as we can. And previous unexplained neonatal deaths is one of the area that uh, uh, we go on uh, uh, without investigation. And so much so that we land in having patients 11th gravida and non alive, 10th gravida and non alive. Uh, currently, we have got two of them. One of them is because of RHI immunization. So it's, it's difficult to manage them, but then we need to do that. So um, uh, this is still worth breaking this bad news is difficult for all of us. If you have had an unexplained fetal death, horrible, terrible, for the patient, for us, for everyone around. But still birth is in the air. It's a, when the incidence is high, and incidents reported to be 20 to 66 per 1,000 years. And this uh, uh, incidence has decreased on to, there is a different uh, program that is being launched. And government of India also has launched many pro um, programs to decrease stillbirth. Perinatal mortality rate, we may give a, a live birth, but if it succumbs at 22 months, as in uh, our last case, so we need to give them a good baby, that is healthy baby. So the causes could be extreme immaturity, malformation, and uh, this uh, we probably can um, try to avoid this. And uh, that will be highlighted in our prematurity section on ultrasound. Malformation, yes, many of them can be diagnosed, though it's not 100%, but still, at least always that case one, with malformation, huge cleft lip palate. Uh, ultrasonologist may not be able to diagnose cord insertion low down, but could able to diagnose this. The patient had multiple um, ultrasounds done outside and these, those clip clip and pallets were missed. So uh, that should not uh, actually happen. So what I have decided is I will, uh, that is, uh, we, we need to prevent stillbirth. And that is maternal animal preclamps or GDM. Since morning, I'm telling you about preclamps or GDM. 
discuss about German peaks and the rest of the other things, but still, this um, should not be forgotten. So, preterm and RCP in intrahepatic um, cholestasis of pregnancy is in one of our cases that intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy along with chronic hypertension. We try to deliver them uh, not beyond 37 weeks. Sometimes, maybe before 37 weeks, there are some studies saying that if bile acids are more than 100, then you deliver even before that. The FPT growth restriction will be um, uh, in our next section, malformation disease condition. So care during delivery, that is, I need not highlight that, that probably will prevent many stillbirth. And one third of stillbirth is because of intrauterine death. So um, how do we investigate if the fetus is with malformation? That may be like uh, this uh, case, we were lucky in having a video. That means the patient relative had entered into your NICU, has taken this video. We can see that those oxygen mask was removed and then the video. This was the patient father who gave me this, like the husband, who gave me this video. So it's not we who have generated this. So patients are now wise enough to take videos and keeping those videos. Uh, we are wiser than them. Well. So we need to take our photograph if we see a malformation. And X-ray if uh, specifically when you think that long bones are short. When do you expect that long bones are short? You, you um, keep the hands straight. If it is going up to mid thigh, then it's normal. If it is less than mid thigh, it's reaching up to pelvis. These are short long bones. Take X-ray and keep it. So uh, you can prove yourself. Narrow thorax. These babies may succumb. So uh, you can have an X-ray of this. Genetic test, I'm coming on to it. But without malformation, we go back and look for, again, hypertension, and then uh, diabetes, IHCP, all these things we, we try to look into and have a re-look into it. Placenta for histopathology is a must, and blood to be collected for genetic test. So what I say is with malformation, we are doing a genetic test. Without malformation, we are doing genetic test. So what is this genetic test? Uh, so um, uh, if we try to look into um, uh, a colony where there are multiple buildings, and you want to identify whether there is a defect in the building. Similarly, we have got 46 chromosomes. Say, for example, 23 pair of chromosomes. Let's assume that these 23 pair of chromosomes represents each building. So now, if I look into this, then I'm looking from outside and trying to look if there is a defect in the building. And I'm trying to look a series of buildings from outside and trying to find out whether there is a defect in the building. So that is equivalent to doing the chromosomal analysis and it is called as a karyotype. So it's a gross analysis of the chromosomes and counting that chromosome number 21, number 20 building, now that the two number, three number is equivalent to doing a fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization for chromosome 21. So there are uh, clinicians who have done an amnio, done a fish for chromosome 21 and has forgotten everything. So fish 21, the tips, see how many number this rare type building are there in this colony of building. So that can see that, okay, there are two, uh, two buildings, so there are two in number, three in number. It's only that. The rest of the building are not seen in uh, in this uh, analysis or push analysis. So when we are ordering for push of chromosome 21, then you know the report very soon. It's, it's um, okay, so you get a report in for three days. And then next is you are suspecting very high risk for chromosome, uh, chromosome 21 or trisomy 21. So you are counting how many 21 are there. So after understanding this, let's go on to looking into each floor of these buildings. So you may see, you may enter into this floor and then see if everything is fine or not. And then try to identify if there is any defect. So this is 
examination in little different to identify defect in the building. So that way, what you are doing is, this is equivalent to entering into each building, each floor and looking into it. So it is like looking into minor defect, they are in the chromosomes, which is called as a chromosomal microarray. So if we equivalent them to genetic testing or testing for this is microarray analysis. So little bit of control and then you try to see for uh, if there is any defect in building. So now is my work over, everything is done. So if microarray is done and satisfied, no. Still I can have a Defect in the room. I have not entered into the room. So let me enter into the room. I've done something to see if there's any defect or not. So, for example, there may be seepers in one of the corners, there may be this, that, anything can happen to this room. So, that will not be uh, identified if I confine myself to this examination. So, so looking into the room is equivalent to looking into examining all, all possible genes or all meaningful genes and exome of all these genes and what is called as a whole exome sequencing. Exactly this is the way I explain our patient to make them understand why we, we say that these, uh, these tests will be in steps. So first is looking into the buildings from outside, that is karyotype. Looking every floor is microarray. Looking into every row, every meaningful floor uh, is uh, exome sequencing. And here, uh, mind it, we have not examined the toilets. And probably the kitchen and all. So, whole exome sequencing doesn't mean looking into every every defect of the gene. All genome sequencing is looking into every of all those buildings. 46 buildings, they are there inside our every cell. So looking into every corner is not possible. That is why what uh, is recommended is looking into every room. Like uh, you want to go and live in a room. Not, you will not see the kitchen. You will never see a kitchen of the hotel. Many book a room. You see the rooms, how it is and how beautiful it is, and then you book it. So similarly, there are meaningful living room, and that is the reason why I have written that examination of each living room. And hence, there are certain areas of the genes that are not examined by whole exome sequencing. So, but whole exome sequencing looks into all meaningful area of the genes or exomes of the gene which codes for a protein. So that is whole exome sequencing. Why I am insisting on this is at least those who are there must understand and can advise the cost of this has decreased. If you are doing say Malcolm baby with both the parents, then uh, the cost um, is uh, quite low. So we do it every day. So let me take up some few examples. One is this is a mother with previous child like this. So you straight away do a travel time from the blood. First 1,000, 1,500 only. So and better report than this. So it is trisomy 21. So this is Down syndrome. Uh, like examination also, the pediatric clinic will tell you this is Down syndrome. Then you confirm it. So there is extra chromosome subsequent pregnancy. The risk is 1%. And this is the woman who previous baby with Down syndrome, with trisomy 21. So this patient can be, if she opts for an NIPT, a screening test, then you should advance an NLPT, not a serum screen. And if the patient doesn't want, want straight away an invasive testing, that is, uh, you can do a CVS or an amniocentesis. This woman actually opted for a CVS and it was normal. So in cardiotone, you may see uh, one extra uh, sex chromosome like XXY, so this is XXY, what is called as a client filter in our day-to-day -day practice, it may be seen in infertility. 
we have had a phd student whose husband was detected to be in a client center after marriage so uh, and uh, when attended to a infertility clinic so this uh, in fact can happen and those um, where i saw um, a down syndrome who came to early days of my um, this thing um, uh, here only they came for down syndrome uh, not down syndrome infertility in the husband and on examination the husband was down syndrome so in your day to day practice in a, in a gynecologist also can see clown filter coming to your infertility clinic what we are get to see is lot of cases of recurrent spontaneous abortion and what is seen in recurrent spontaneous abortion what do you expect it has to be a balanced translocation if the the couple is normal with the mums then there will be balanced translocation here there is balance between Uh, balance between chromosome uh, six and four, so four to six translocation, which is balanced because there is no loss or gain of genetic material. If there is any loss or gain, what will happen is the person will manifest with that loss. If there is gain, then person will manifest. If clinically they are normal, so there there will be balanced translocation. And usually it's seen in uh, um, uh, recurrent abortion. Trisomy 18 are found fetus. You see trisomy 18, and you in this uh, similar to RSA, you may see a reduction in translocation between chromosome 13 and 21. So. And this is chromosome twenty one is what and then attached to thirteen. So we have the total number of chromosome will be forty five instead of forty six because these two are not counted as thirteen and twenty one. They are counted as one. So the counting because two are counted as one, so total chromosome number will be forty five. The translocation between thirteen twenty one. In an infertility clinic, why it is important is. These women or men who is carrying this can have a normal pregnancy. Abnormality is seen in maximum up to five to ten percent of cases. Rest ninety percent will have normal. But if instead of thirteen twenty one, if it is thirteen thirteen, thirteen has got attached to thirteen or twenty one twenty one, then fourteen fourteen. Similarly, with same same chromosome, recurrence risk of abnormality is hundred percent. Here is the couple who needs gamma donation. So this is a like we have had a patient who uh, had to have uh, like twenty one twenty one translocation. All fetuses will be trisomy twenty one or have seen abortion. So this is our role in doing the cardiac chromosomal analysis. Now if there is a baby is mentally uh, like uh, subnormality, there is mental subnormality. We have done cardiac type. Oh, I missed out. That karyotype report. Karyotype report is normal. So now you have looked onto the building, and building is looks normal. You go into the corridor. Here we have gone onto the corridor. That is microarray analysis, and microarray shows heterozygous deletion of this area, and then the lab will tell you that there is this deletion is response to this. And we need not remember it. It is difficult to remember. It is not essential to remember. That is their job. So use of microarrays. We do or we use microarray. We we use microarray when cardiotype is normal in a malformation. So in malformation, we first do a cardiotype. If it is normal, then we go ahead and must do a microarray. In a child who is developmentally delayed, in stillbirth, because in cardiotype. Live tissues and cardiotype cannot be done in dead tissues. So, product of conception and stillborn, there is no live tissue. So, it cannot be cultured. It cannot be arrested in metaphase. It cannot be done. So, what you get is a report is a the the culture failed. So, in that case, you need to have uh, you can do microarray which can detect any abnormality if there. What is microarray cannot detect is a balanced translocation. That I showed you that there is no gain or loss. If there is a gain or loss, then it can it can detect. So um, RSA, if the couple wants to have a cause like recurrent abortion, many of the couple wants to have a cause. Product of conception can be can be subjected for microarray and can be uh, defect can be seen. Then prenatal invasive test is being done. For any other indication, 
This is the minimum limitation of, say, for example, the woman is at a high risk for having a Down syndrome baby. Now you have done a Down syndrome, Down syndrome is negative. If the second fetal sample, the fetal sample is there in the distance. So the current, current guideline is coming at that. Same patient, you, same tissue can be subjected to microarray and additional. One to two percent. There's a two percent in our experience. It is three percent, three point six percent. Additional microarray abnormality pick up by doing a microarray analysis. So, uh, if we go and see the pediatric literature, then in newborn they are developmentally delayed. They are not malformed. Then there is no dysmorphism. They are absolutely normal, but they are. There is subnormality, mental subnormality. So they are the micro abnormalities around six to seven percent. So to pick them up, you can do if you are taking out in uh, fifty sample for some other reason, the same sample can be done for micro with an additional little amount of additional cost. So uh, that is why this cost. So uh, next, coming on to what is whole exome sequencing, here is one ultrasound image, so it's hydrocephalus, definitely. Looking closer on to it, uh, this is um, thanks to Dr. Sangeeta for taking those good images, and so it's adductor thumb. And then the baby, this was late in gestation. So this child was born here, and you can see that the thumb is, bilateral thumb is something like this, adductor. And so adapted thumb, it is magnified view. Now, if you see, then we do uh, actually this is report of that previous pregnancy is not there. So uh, uh, when we did the collection sequencing analysis of this child, this child, so this found out to have L1 cam mutation or some mutation which is excellent recessive, and that was present in the affected fetus. Subsequently, the mother was tested. Mother is a carrier. This CBS was done recently, that is October 2022. And uh, we have found out that this fetus is the current pregnancy, the fetus is homozygous normal. So, how do you read this whole exam sequencing report? Is that the first column says what is the sample? Then, so G, we may not know about this gene or exon or the variant. It only says that the amino acids what is replaced by the at which position. So this is what tryptophan at seven eighty four position is replaced by cysteine. But what is most important for us is inheritance. So it it writes it tells you excellent recessive. So you know that you may be you this is excellent recessive. Sometimes they say that it is uncertain, like uh, the literature is uh, not clear about autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. They write So then you found that excellent recessive. I told you in the morning, then uh, this excellent recessive hydrocephalus, all these will be male child who will have. Affection. So these are all male affection. So how do you go to read all this? This is freely available software and that is earning on online Mendelian reference in man. So uh, you can write the same uh, disease and you can read about the disease, what are uh, how many cases has been reported and all uh, that gets updated every time. London Medical Database, we used to do it. And this is you have to purchase that. I, um, in our initial days, we used to do it to have a differential diagnosis. What the uh, putting all those features, what is the differential diagnosis? But uh, these days, with the availability of net, it has become easy and less people are using it. Similar to London Medical Database, there is one another way that has to be purchased, like called POSA. So I had used this data, and this is for uh, this thing. So practical tip is chromosomal analysis is done on live cells. For that, you have to uh, send QML blood in heparinized vial. So if this vial are not there, you just heparinize a syringe, 
the way we go for any other heterogeneized heterogeneization. So you take heparin and then push it back. So it is heparinization of the series, but sterile technique. You collect to ml blood in it and send to the lab at the earliest. See, I've written live cells. So the cells have to be live. So hence, it has to be sent at the earliest to the lab so that they can put it into culture media and then they can do chromosomal analysis. The cost of chromosomal analysis from like my initial days was 7,000, it has decreased to 1,500, even less than that. So it's 1,000, so everybody can do that. Microanalysis, you can do it in tissue. And for that, you have to collect QML blood in the EGTR, and they take out DNA and do analysis. So uh, like a fitting skin, then a piece of cord can be sent, or a placental tissue can be sent. But we should remember that placenta is not equivalent to fetus always. And something called, there may be a placental mosaicism or defect in the placenta, but not in the fetus. So that's why we try to avoid placental tissue. We try to take fetal sample. Next comes is home exome sequencing. This, as an obstetrician to me, next two years, probably all of us will be advising this. Any patient who has got previous mental retardation, previous malformation, uh, many of them, we are able to diagnose very rare things. Cialidosis, some enzyme defect, involuntary metabolism, you can't think about. Like earlier days, we used to do enzyme massing. Now you do the send for an exome sequencing, you pick it up. So no uh, more clinical exome is essential. Clinical exome was we used to inform the lab what are the clinical features. Now that is also not essential. So what is what is done is to ML blood in the DTA and you need to write home exome sequencing. So all exome are sequenced and they will tell you what is the defect. If the patient comes in between pregnancy, then you can test one couple first. If the previous child is not alive, if the previous child is alive, it is always better to test the child affected individual first. So if not, then you can uh, go ahead and do a whole exam sequencing um, of that uh, of one of the couple. Once that uh, um, one is identified, then the other partner can be tested. So formally, formally are not good for DNA test. And hence, they, they break the DNA, they fragment the DNA, so quality is not good, and hence, the lab sometimes cannot do this um, whole exome sequencing on con. So if you want to send a sample, you send, put it in uh, normal channel, and add few drops of gentamicin onto it. So uh, antibiotics, so uh, they can do. It's a flow diagram of steel board that I have taken from one of the webinar actually. So uh, this is uh, in uh, American Journal 2020 that uh, says that if there is, um, you need to find out maternal uh, this thing, um, uh, diseases, then if suspect fetal anomaly, then genetic testing, fetal autopsy and placental pathology, intrapartum stillbirth, you need to look for antiphospholipid and fetal maternal hemorrhage and other testing. And preterm labor, Korean, and that is PPRM needs to be looked into. So all still that is to be reported first. Uh, the records needs to be kept. Then third is um, the, you try to find figure out what is the cause of stillbirth. And hence, you can prevent the cause of stillbirth. So thank you, everyone, for um, uh, 